Hey guys. How are you guys doing? Good, good, okay. You guys made it through another week. Let's go. Welcome. Yeah, clap it up. You know the vibes. I'm oh so happy to be here. Yeah, okay. So welcome to the general body meeting. We won't get into this real quickly. Oh, yeah. Announcements. Join the Discord. Please, please join the Discord. No, we're not joining the Discord. Okay. If you guys aren't in it, here's the QR code. Please scan it if you're not. I assume you guys are. Oh, that is how you get pizza. I forgot. Yeah. You have to sign in in order to get pizza. Mm, please sign in. Go to the sign in category. Go to general meeting. And then react to that. Is it done? It's, it's up. Okay. See? See? Can someone check, please? Oh. Okay. Give us one second. I'm going to remind you guys after the announcements are over. Okay. Okay. It's good. Please sign in then. All right. Guys, right, make sure to check the calendar. That's so you know when all the events are. Also, join the mailing list so you can get those sweet, sweet weekly updates. The newsletters, I'm sorry, not updates. That's how you know what the topic of the week. That is very true. That's how you know what the topic of the week is in advance so you can prepare your minds. Meet the sponsors, clap it up. Come on, let's go, let's go. Mm. Keep going. Mm. And keep going. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Make sure to follow our social media. We're consistently posting now. Those posts are fire. They're heat. Really good. All right. Okay. Jason's not here, so I guess I'm going to do it for him. Uh... We're having exam prep for uh, Jesus 123. Uh, it's going to be held from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday the 16th in the RIT Site Club Room. If you guys need some help, which I know some of you kind of do, and that's okay, uh, please come. Up here we have the QR code so we can get a good head count. Um, you guys should scan that QR code and sign up. It'll be a fun time. I'll give you guys some time to sign that. You know, scan that, excuse me. I know you're not, Billy. You guys good? All right. It looks like there might be an issue with sign-ins right now, so uh, we, we might have to redo the sign-in and just keep an eye on the general meeting sign-in channel. Uh, react to my message if you did not receive a message from OB, so that way we can make sure it's like a everyone issue. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to have my sweet, sweet boy, Bailey Powers, give the presentation on Intro to Physical Security. Everybody clap for Bailey. We love him here. Oh, yeah. Here you go, sweet boy. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. All right. So now with that, all you guys skip physical. You get subjected to it now. <laughs> um, all right. So this is physical security. Uh, I'm Bailey. I'm a third-year CSEC major. Uh, I'm the physical interest group lead and the treasurer. Uh, it's my Discord handle and my Instagram if you want to follow that. <laughs> oh, whoops. All right, so ethics. Uh, the skills that I'm going to teach you today are only to be performed on stuff that you actually own. Uh, don't try to break into stuff that you don't own or else you will go to jail. Um, or we will get in trouble with the GCI. So uh, make sure you don't do anything bad. Uh, so first... Yes. No, I'll know about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so first, this presentation isn't all about locks. Uh, that's probably what you expected. Uh, it's only about half locks. Um, <laughs> uh, but the beginning part isn't. Uh, so why is physical security important? I thought this was computer club. Uh, because I said so. But also because uh, all of your computer tricks uh, won't help if I can just plug directly into your laptop. <laughs> Uh, you can do as much as you want, but if you have physical access, you pretty much have full range to do whatever. Um, it, it's very important. Physical security is one of the most important things. Uh, so first, we're going to talk a little bit about alternate entry. Uh, first, we're going to talk about canned air. 
you know, usually it's used as like computer duster to clean things off. Uh, but also you could use it to uh, open up motion sensor doors. Uh, motion sensor doors use, uh, I think it's radar, um, or some kind of radar to uh, like actually sense that people are walking through it. Uh, and canned air, when you flip it over, or canned air in general uses a thing called, or uses nitrogen and a bunch of other gases in a liquid form to actually create the air. Uh, when you flip the can over, the nitrogen liquid comes out before the gas, creating this like white smoke effect. Uh, if you take the little straw that comes in the canned air and like shove it between the door and, uh, and put it right in front of like the sensor uh, and actually like dispense a bunch of the liquid, uh, it'll open the door just like you're walking through it, unlocking the door. Uh, so if you can't get into one side, just use a little bit of canned air and the door will pop open. Uh, it's really simple. Uh, so the next one is hinges. Uh, if you can see the door's hinges, you can get it open. Um, instead of like picking it or trying to find another way around it, if you just take a hammer and just remove the hinges of a door, you can just pull the door right off. Uh, it can't be locked if you can just pull the door off. Um, hold on, I'm gonna fix this because my speaker notes aren't here. I want them. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so door latches. Uh, this is an image of a door latch that's on many doors. You probably see them around campus, um, in your houses, anything like that. Uh, the way it works is, is that there is a latch and then a strike plate. Uh, when the door is closing, it'll ride up the latch on the smooth side, uh, allowing the deadlock plunger to be uh, depressed, or the deadlock to be depressed and uh, slip right into the, um, the strike plate. Uh, and once it's inside the strike plate, it'll pop back open. Um, this would allow for an attack of uh, shimming, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit after. But um, the way that the people who manufacture doors uh, figured out how to stop this was a use of thing called a deadlock plunger, which is this little, that little thing on top of the latch. Uh, it's not really marked on this sheet, but it's kind of like this little thing right here. Um, when that's depressed, uh, it actually stops the entire latch from depressing. Um, so there are specifically built uh, strike plates to make sure that the latch is depressed when it, or, or the door plunger is depressed when uh, the door is closed, uh, allowing or stopping any type of shimming attacks. But uh, when contractors come through and build a building, they usually don't like to uh, carry the specific size that's needed. They usually just carry one size, uh, usually the biggest because all of the doors will fit the biggest size. Um, that leaves most doors vulnerable to uh, this attack. Uh, if the entire system, the deadlock and the deadlock plunger are allowed to fit inside the strike plate, there's really nothing stopping the deadlock from, or the latch from being able to be pushed down by something like a credit card or a door latch shim. Um, I bought this shim from Harbor Freight for like 99 cents. Uh, <laughs> it, all you gotta do is, is if you see like a gap in a door, you just kind of hook it over and pull backwards, uh, unlocking, just riding that little slope of the latch up and unlocking the door. Uh, if it's facing you, you could take like a credit card or a piece of plastic and also ride up the little slope unlocking the door. Uh, it's super common vulnerability. Uh, and really the only way to stop it is to make sure that you have the specific size strike plate for the door plunger. Um, but I know that it's really <laughs> not an easy fix and pretty expensive. Uh, so the next one uh, are crash bars and panic bars. Uh, these are also super common. I think they're some kind of a fire safety code uh, for like ease of access, uh, but they're also super vulnerable. If the gap is too big between the door and uh, or the two doors in the middle, you can kind of just stick like a piece of metal as seen in this uh, little image below. You could uh, stick the piece of metal in between the door and uh, just the door and the plastic part and pull back on the put crash bar unlocking the door. Uh, you can't really lock the crash bar from closing. So a lot of these are vulnerable. Uh, 
and they're super common as well. Um, so next, uh, handle and a little bit of string. Oh, is this not full screen anymore? I just noticed that. You can't. You can't? Okay. Uh, so if the door has one of these like ugly little door handles, you know, with the designs on the end, or it's kind of like a lever door, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, you can kind of uh, slip like a piece of string or like a stick and a piece of string under the door or above the door and try to wrap it around the little door handle. Uh, this can allow you to just pull up and open the door from the other side. Uh, it's super easy to do if the door is like, I don't know, glass. Um, you know, uh, you could also do a blind, but that's a little harder. Um, there's a lot of doors that are vulnerable to this as well because uh, it would be a issue of use if you couldn't open it from the inside because uh, you can't get out that way. Um. <laughs> So one of the next, and this is a big issue, is compromised keys. Uh, so some places just have common keys for ease of use. Uh, like when it comes to jobs like firefighting, they have the keys that uh, open the elevators and make them either stop or come down to the bottom floor. Um, and then TSA also has a bunch of keys for all of their locks, uh, usually ones that are on suitcases and different baggage stuff. Uh, the funny thing is, is that these were kind of leaked to the public because they're so common. Um, you can actually 3D print <laughs> the TSA keys or buy them on Amazon for like 10 bucks. Um, and that'll open up literally every single suitcase, uh, suitcase lock you could think of. Uh, and although the, uh, the firefighter keys are different for every state, you can also get them. And you can kind of just like look at the bidding and figure that out. Um, they're really cheap and super dangerous because they don't really change them. Uh, and so that really brings us into our next uh, issue is key cutting or impressioning. Uh, key cutting tools are super common. Uh, they're like 30 bucks and the blank keys themselves are like 75 cents, <laughs> a few pennies, you know. Um, they're super cheap and uh, once you know like the bidding of a lock, it's super easy to cut a key to that length. Um, this, uh, you know, uh, usually locksmiths use this to like make you a new key or like, you know, make a key for a specific door, make like a company like a bunch of different keys so that a bunch of employees can open the door, family, houses, stuff like that. So that being said, please for the love of God, don't post your keys on social media. <laughs> this would make it way too easy for somebody to break into whatever you're trying to keep safe. So, you know, say you're this guy who just got a new, uh, a new job or, you know, built a new shed and he's flexing his key on social media. You know, he's flexing it, showing everybody, oh, look at this, I got a new uh, house. Uh, I could just take your key. This I did in like two seconds. That is a key blank that I found online and I just kind of cut it to the shape of his key. Uh, if I had a key cutter, I could open it up, go steal, I don't know, his lawnmower out of his shed or something. <laughs> just ruin his day. Uh, or, you know, say you're a couple who just moved into their first apartment and you want to post this cute picture on social media, you know. Uh, it's really cute. Not if I have your key. <laughs> <laughs> say goodbye to that big engagement ring. <laughs> uh, or, you know, you could be like Sylvester Stallone and post uh, every single key to the Vatican. <laughs> on his Instagram. <laughs> it's a very special moment. Uh, so <laughs> now that that's over, uh, we're going to get into lock picking, everybody's favorite part. Uh, so there's a bunch of parts to the lock. Uh, the core, the key pin, which is the bottom part, seen in blue. Uh, that's kind of what the key interacts with or what you'd be interacting with for lock picking. Uh, the shear line is in between the two, uh, the two parts of the the actual pin, uh, this is where the core kind of meets the outer part of the core, which is seen in gray. Uh, and then the driver pins, which are the things seen in red, uh, they're just the other half of the pin, which allow you to uh, actually open the lock. And then the springs, which keeps compression down on all of the pins, so they're at the bottom. Um, that's basically how most locks that you would see work. Uh, there's a bunch of different kinds, but this is one of the most common. Uh, 
So how the pin tumbler actually functions, uh, when you slide a key in, all of the keys are cut to a different length, and that can be seen on the key. Um, as seen in like the bottom image there, uh, there's a bunch of different slopes and a bunch of different key lengths. Uh, when all of the key, or when all of the pins are set to that specific height, uh, you can turn the core clockwise and actually open up the lock or whatever you're trying to open. Uh, up in the first picture, all of the keys are down at the bottom, or all the pins are down at the bottom, and none of them are at the shear line. And then once they're all brought up to the shear line, that's when the lock is in the open state. Uh, so that's kind of what we're trying to emulate when we're actually lock picking. Uh, so the basic tools we use to do this are hook picks. Uh, these are very strong metal little, little devices with a little hook on the end. And these are used to feel the individual pins within the lock. Um, a lot of different companies make them. Some are more uncomfortable than others, but uh, you know they all have basically the same mechanism and allow the user to use leverage to push up on the individual pins. Um, oh, and it's used for an attack called just single pin picking, where you go through and you touch each individual pin instead of some of the other attacks that we're going to talk about. Uh, and next is the rake pick. This is another one of the most common picks, and these are used for brute force or random attacks. Uh, the attacker will just move the pick in and out in like a random motion while putting tension on the lock, and eventually it'll pop open just because of luck. Um, it kind of just goes in a random order, you know, like the waves will cause different pins to go up at different times. Uh, it's like brute forcing a password if you think about it. Uh, so the next most important tool, which we'll use every time, is tension wrenches. Uh, there are two types of tension wrenches, uh, top of the keyway tension wrench and bottom of the keyway. Uh, both do exactly the same thing. Uh, both move the core in a clockwise motion. Uh, you're just trying to emulate a key. Um, yeah, you're trying to emulate a key. Basically, they kind of are what they sound like. So top of the keyway goes to the top, bottom of the keyway goes in the bottom. Um, not much more than that. But uh, tensioning is super important when you're lock picking. Uh, by pushing up on the key pins and putting tension on the spinning core, uh, the attacker is able to set the driver pin uh, on the little lip that's created uh, when putting tension on the core. Uh, it's kind of seen in this little diagram right here. You can see the lock, the blue pin is kind of getting stuck on that little lip that's being created uh, from tension in that diagram. Uh, this will allow the, uh, the pins to be pushed up and kept in place at the shear line as well as giving the other pins, uh, or like loosening up the other pins and uh, allowing them to be pushed up as well. Uh, this, is, this happens because of something called binding order. Uh, usually when uh, companies are making locks or manufacturing locks, uh, you're never going to get it perfect. So there's a lot of different machining tolerances that go into it. Uh, this is an image of kind of like an exaggerated version of that. Uh, but they're all supposed to be centered on this line so that when you put the key in, it goes perfectly up and perfectly down. But when uh, machining can't get that perfect, so there's obviously some lips that we will use to our advantage to rest our driver pins on. Um, but uh, yeah, this actually creates a thing called a binding order because uh, some of the lips are bigger than others, which means that they will be able to be, like, you could put the pin on them first rather than others. So in this diagram, uh, number five would probably be the first to bind because it's hanging off the edge more, and then it would kind of go down from there. Uh, I don't know why it's numbered like that, but uh, yeah. So uh, these are just a couple of the more basic locks that you'd see around. Uh, we got uh, just like your basic master lock, with the pin tumbler lock that you'd see in like a door. Um, and then this is kind of what's inside of each of these locks is this little, little gold piece. Um, that just makes up the basis of most locks. Uh, so the basic technique, uh, <laughs> we got these nice demonstrations from Enzo. Uh, I think these are his hands. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, he's using a bottom of the keyway tensioner in the first image. Uh, by putting the pressure using your pointer finger on the tension wrench, 
Oh, it's in the, all the way on the right. Yeah. Uh, that's creating tension. You kind of hold it as in your palm and just reaching your finger over and pushing down the tension wrench. Uh, then in the middle, we got the pick. It's a basic hook pick. And you kind of hold it like you would be writing a pencil or using a pencil. Um, and then in the, all the way on the left, we have the top of the keyway tensioner. And it's just got the tensioner at the top using the same clockwise motion and same, holding it in the same kind of position, uh, allowing you to put clockwise tension. Uh, so one of the, of the other attacks that could be used is something called a comb attack. Uh, it uses these things called comb picks. Uh, they're also super common. Uh, these affect a lot of master locks and a lot of like poor quality locks. Uh, it allows the attacker to actually like lift all of the pins above the shear line, both the driver pin and the key pin. It lifts it above the shear line, allowing you to just turn the core. Uh, if there's no pins stopping you, you could just turn it as much as you want. Um, yeah, this one's super fun. You don't even need a tension wrench for these, actually, because um, you kind of just use it as a key. Uh, but these are super cool. Um, yeah. Uh, and then another bypass. Uh, this is another common bypass, usually in the 140s and the 150s. Uh, the way the latches are held in these locks are using from what I understand, two little metal bars that uh, interlock with each other. Uh, when you're picking this lock, if you manage to uh, put your pick farther than the core, passing all the pins all the way up to the top of the lock, uh, you're able to knock those two little metal pieces apart that are holding the latch in, and the, lat uh, the latch will just pop open. Um, so a lot of the time when people come to physical, uh, they'll like pop open a 140 or a 150 and they'll be like, I don't know how I did that. Like this is supposed to be like a harder lock. Chances are you probably just accidentally did the bypass. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's not that hard to do. It just kind of takes luck along with like all of this other problems. But uh, yeah. Uh, so next, uh, in the same vein is the American lock bypass. Uh, this usually only works on American locks or kind of like the larger, more industrial looking locks. Um, the way that this one works is you take this little golf club shaped pick here uh, and you're gonna do the same thing as you would do in the master lock bypass and just put it all the way up behind the core. Um, when looking at like a lock, I don't know if I have, yeah. This is not going with it, but I'm just using this as an example. Uh, you could kind of see how on the back of the core there, it's cut in half. Um, that is used to interlock with the inside of the actual like lock housing, uh, which is keeping the shackle in place. If you use this little golf club shaped tool, you could pretty much bypass that entire little system and just twist the inside, uh, other, the other inside half and open the lock. Um, but American locks don't want you to really do that, so they invented this thing called a bypass wafer, which is a little little piece of metal, like you see right there, uh, that has that little slit cut out of it for the back of the lock. Uh, this will stop the attacker from actually putting the pick all the way through the back and interacting with like the inner mechanisms of the actual shackle or housing. Uh, so that sounds really easy, but uh, now we got to make it really hard. <laughs> um, so security pins. Uh, they were invented by Linus Yale Jr. in 1865 for his locks, I guess. Um, we hate him. I don't know why he did this to us. Uh, but his pin, it kind of had like a little line in the bottom, uh, allowing the pin to get stuck. Sometimes it wasn't really the best. That's why we've upgraded to much different kinds. But uh, basically, the idea was that when you pushed up the lock, it would get stuck if you were trying to pick it. Um, I don't really think there were a lot of people trying to pick locks back then, so I don't really understand why he made it. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's because he hates us. But he did it. Um, yeah, so one of the more common 
uh, security pins that you're going to see is uh, the serrated pins. These are in probably most locks that you see uh, that are, say, like pick resistant on it, or you know, are like level six in like I guess master locks, like speak. Uh, it'll have something called a serrated pin in there. It, it's just a pin that has a bunch of lines cut out in it. And just like the diagram states, it's kind of just using it to uh, get stuck at multiple points when you're pushing up the pins instead of uh, just being able to go all the way up to the shear line. Uh, pretty much these just give you like a few false clicks and uh, and it gets stuck a little bit, but these aren't like the hardest to pick. Uh, usually you can just brute force them upwards and eventually you'll get it right. It'll find, you'll fall into the right little line and that'll be at the shear line. Uh, it's a little harder when there's a lot of them, but most of those locks only have one of them. Uh, so then the next kind of security pin is a spool pin. Uh, these are really hard to pick. These ones are arguably the hardest. Um, you're probably not going to run into a lot of locks that have them uh, unless you're trying to pick something super hard. Uh, they're called spool pins because they look like, you know, like the little spool of yarn. Uh, but they have those little divot in the middle cut out for it. Um, when putting tension on the core, uh, it'll get stuck right in the middle of the pin uh, and giving this like false sensation that you've opened the lock. Uh, the core will only turn like halfway, uh, and you can't really push farther than that. Uh, it's what we call a false set, and it's caused by these pins. Um, uh, you can see on the one side that the one side of the lip is getting caught, and you can't push the blue pin up anymore. Um, that's why they're so hard, because uh, to get out of this, you're going to have to pretty much reset the whole lock and start over from scratch. Um, so usually when you're picking, you would want to go for one of these first uh, just to get it out of the way. Uh, these, you don't see these ones as often, uh, but these are called mushroom pins. Uh, they are just used basically in the same vein as uh, spool pins and do the same thing. Uh, they're not super common. I'm not sure they're used a lot anymore, but uh, yeah, I guess you could find them in this Anubis titanium lock, um, but they do the same thing. I don't have a fun little diagram for this, um, but yeah. Uh, and then one of the last ones, there's a lot, but this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is uh, the serrated key pins. These usually go along with the serrated pins and give a false sense of clicking, but on the bottom pin this time, uh, so this allows you or allows the pins to kind of trick the user that they are uh, still on the top pin uh, and haven't hit the shear line yet. But in reality, you could have overset the pin and uh, gone past the shear line and now are getting false clicks on the bottom key pin. Um, these are usually found in like American locks, uh, not super common, but very difficult to pick. Uh, and then, uh, finally, we have all of the, uh, the key wardings. Uh, most locks have different kinds of key wardings, uh, and these are just used to kind of thwart the use of tension wrenches. Uh, a lot of locks like to put little divots at the bottom so that your tension wrench keeps slipping out whenever you're trying to twist or put tension on the core. Um, yeah, they also make them in really weird shapes, so you can't get the the picks or the tension wrenches in. Um, I know that a lot of people who came to physical were struggling with the master locks because they have a huge little gap at the bottom that their tension wrenches kept slipping into. Um, uh, there's no real way to get around this. I mean, you can use the top of the keyway tensioner. Uh, the top of the keyway usually stays the same for most locks, so uh, you can just switch to that or just continue with the bottom of the keyway and just use like a larger, thicker bottom of the keyway pick. Um, but then you still have to get the, the actual pick into the lock. Um, top of the keyway is the pro strut, I agree. Yeah, so if you're going to start, make sure to get a top of the keyway. Um, 
I haven't really hit time yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. None. Yeah. All right. Uh, so in conclusion, lots of fun things to learn and know. Uh, if you want to know more, just come to physical uh, Tuesdays, 2 to 3 in the air gap. Uh, you know, it's really fun. Lots of different things that we do up there. Um, I think that next week we're going to talk about repinning, uh, which, you know, that's, that's pretty fun, kind of hard. Uh, if you like to work with your hands, definitely show up. Uh, so anybody have any questions? Anthony? I said that Tuesdays 2 to 3 in the air gap. And on the website. And on the calendar. Subscribe to the calendar. Uh, is there any lock you can't pick? Uh, there's a lot of locks I can't pick, but um, you could look at the lock picking lawyer on YouTube, and he can pick pretty much literally anything. I don't think I've seen him not be able to open anything. Uh, you know, kind of like computers, there's always going to be a vulnerability. Um, you just kind of have to figure out what it is. It might not be picking, but it might be something else. Yeah. A letter combination lock? Yeah. Uh, there's a cool, oh, have I ever picked a letter combination lock? I didn't talk about it in the presentation, but uh, I think, oh, yeah, it's not going to be on here. But um, basically, there's kind of two ways that you can do it. Um, just kind of depends on what kind of lock it is. Uh, there are these locks, like master locks. They are, they have like combinations on the bottom. They're yellow and the lock face is on the bottom. Uh, there's a tool that you can use to bypass um, pretty much the whole mechanism. It's a really super thin piece of metal that goes on the side of uh, like the number wheel. And if you just push that all the way back and pull up, uh, the lock will pop open. Um, I know that without using like the TSA keys, uh, you could also open up a lot of those locks by uh, pulling down on the shackle and uh, just moving the little number wheel, uh, eventually you'll feel like one that's harder to turn than the other. And I think that means that it's usually on that number. And from there, you can go to the next one, uh, just because of the way that the locks are made. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how does a bump attack work? A bump attack? Like, Oh, yeah. Um, so it kind of works in the same vein as uh, the rake. It's kind of like a random a random attack. Um, I don't know if I could Google it, but the keys are kind of cut really weird. Uh, the key, it's like a key, and they're all cut to the same, same line. So there's like a bunch of little mountains. Uh, I can't really explain it, but um, there's a, a little rubber piece on the end of the key or like the top of the key, um, and all those little mountains. And then you take a hammer, and uh, you put the key in the door, and then you slam the back of the key with a hammer, and that'll cause all of the pins to like jump up. And if you do it at the right time, and you get lucky enough, and you twist the key, and hit it with the hammer at the same time, sometimes you get lucky and the door will open, or the lock will open. It's kind of pretty much how brakes work, but a little more complicated. Um, that's as far as I know. Uh, anybody else? All right. Thank you. Oh, Penny. Okay. They're very soft. Nice, nice. Well, okay. Everybody give uh, barely a barely round of applause for that excellent uh, presentation.